ان الحمد لله تعالى نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له اشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلوات الله والسلام عليه اما بعد فان استقى الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار ثم اما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته اخواني when i was thinking about what to do here today i didn't want to make it just an evening of stories because everybody likes to hear stories but subhanallah we may go away and our iman is been raised slightly but perhaps we won't really have gained any benefit we won't really have gained any benefit we won't really be any more able or more knowledgeable when it comes to ruqya so what i want to do today bi idhnillahi ta'ala is go through from beginning to end very very briefly but to give you brothers inshallah and sisters as well a, a better insight into what ruqya is how to perform it and then inshallah i'll mention some of my experiences as well bi ta'ala so the first thing if somebody was to say to you what is ruqya what is ruqya and is this word ruqya found in the quran or in the sunnah of the prophet alayhi salatu salam the answer is yes ruqya is actually found in the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam in sahih muslim it's narrated by Awf ibn Malik radiallahu an. He says that we used to recite Ruqya during the times of Jahiliya. So during the times of Jahiliya, when somebody would be stung by a scorpion or anything like this, they would recite Ruqya, but they weren't Muslim. And then they came to the Prophet alayhi salatu salam. And they said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, what do you think about that? And then the Prophet alayhi salam, he said to them, recite your ruqyas to me. So tell me what your ruqyas are. And then the Prophet alayhi salam, he said, there is nothing wrong with ruqya that does not involve shirk. There is nothing wrong with ruqya that does not involve shirk. So from this hadith, we have a broad outline of what ruqya is. As long as it doesn't involve shirk or you're not innovating in the religion, then this is permissible. It's also narrated from Jabir radiallahu an that the Prophet alayhi salatu salam, he forbade ruqya. So he said to the people, all ruqya is now forbidden. This is similar to the way that they forbade visiting the graveyards. So at the beginning of Islam, when the people were entering into the religion new, the Prophet alayhi salam, he completely closed the door because people in the times of Jahiliyyah, they would go and ask of the graves. So when they were new to Islam, the Messenger salam closed the door and Jabir is saying he, uh, you know, he forbade Ruqya the same way because he didn't want shirk to come into the Ummah. So then one of the companions, Amr ibn Hazm, his family was bitten by a scorpion and then they took, a, took him to the Prophet wasallam, and he said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, we had Ruqya that we used to recite for scorpion stings, but now you have forbidden Ruqya. They recited it to him, i.e. they recited what they were reading to the Prophet And then he said, I do not see anything wrong with it. Whoever amongst you can help your brother, let him do so. So the fact is this word Ruqya is mentioned in the Sunnah of the Prophet In other words, it is recitation of Quran an authentic adhkar seeking a cure from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Quran my dear brothers and sisters is a healing for all illnesses we have to understand this because Allah says in the Quran وَنُنَزِّلُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مَا هُوَ شِفَاءٌ وَرَحْمَةٌ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَلَا يَزِيدُ الظَّالِمِينَ إِلَّا خَسَارًا Allah says and we send down of the Quran that which is a rahmah it's a mercy and a shifa and a healing for the believers and it doesn't increase the wrongdoers except in transgression so the point here is ikhwani whether you are suffering from a headache whether you are suffering from the common cold whether it be magic jinn possession evil eye the cure is found in the book of allah 
The cure is found in the authentic adhkar of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. I want to mention now, when is ruqya required for jinn possession? How do you know that a person is possessed? I want to mention some of the signs now. And in actual fact, we could do a whole lecture or a series of lecture on each one of these topics. How do you know that a person is possessed? The first thing and the most obvious thing is when the Quran is recited or when the recitation of Quran is heard. So for example, on the TV, you have people reciting Quran, you have the prayers from Mecca, you have the Adhan playing, etc. When somebody is possessed, naturally they will hate this. They will hate this, they will walk out of the room, they may become agitated or angry, they may begin twitching. This is one of the surefire signs. Another sign is a hatred for cleanliness. A hatred for cleanliness. So for example, I have people and they ring me and they say, this, my brother or my sister or my son hasn't showered for two or three months. Two or three months he hasn't showered. And then you say to them, why haven't you showered? And they literally can't bring themselves to go in and have a wash. Why is this? Because the shayateen, they like places of filth. They like places of filth, places of dirt. This is why when we go into the bathroom, we make the dua and we ask Allah for protection for the, from the male and female unclean evil spirits. So, just a side point, we have to make sure that our bodies are a place of cleanliness. It's part of our Iman as well. Another time that you may find that Ruqya is required for jinn possession is when a person becomes angry very, very quickly. So they have mood swings, they go from being extremely happy to being extremely sad. And when they get angry, they become extremely violent and very, very strong. Very, very strong. And Ikhwani, it's not uncommon to have a, a young child and two or three men need to hold him down because of the strength that they, that they gain when they are possessed by the, by the jinn and by the shayateen. I was in Makkah uh, recently, about three weeks ago, and there was a brother and sister who actually came from the UK and the sister was possessed. The sister was possessed. And we were sitting in Makkah and we went to the hotel room in Makkah to do the Ruqya. And I said, look, let's do the Ruqya in, in Makkah. And subhanAllah, even in Makkah, this sister was extremely strong. She threw her husband off. She just, she's not a big sister, but she just threw her husband and he just went flying. She just went flying. But, but then subhanAllah, after the Ruqya had taken place, the husband was able to control her with just one hand. Just one hand. And we actually uh, gave this, this jinn the name Ace Ventura because it was really quite funny the way it was behaving. So for example, it used to try and do a runner. So whilst we were like coming out of the lift to go to the room, she tried to like run down the hotel. So subhanAllah, even in Makkah, the shayateen, they can follow you. And yes, there is this um, precon preconceived idea that people think I'm going to go to Makkah, I'm going to get better immediately. Sometimes this is the case. Sometimes a person is possessed or they're suffering with magic. As soon as they enter into the boundaries of the Haram of Makkah, they are absolutely fine. They are absolutely fine. There's nothing wrong. But the second they leave, subhanAllah, it comes back again. They enter into the boundaries to enter, enter into Medina. They are absolutely fine. As soon as they leave, they become possessed again or the magic begins to take effect again. Another time, Ikhwani, that uh, Ruqya for jinn possession may be uh, required is when a person begins to love seclusion. So the person begins to love seclusion. Many, many times people will ring me and they'll say, my sister, she just goes for walks at two o'clock in the morning. We don't know where she is. And then we find her in the graveyard. We find her in the graveyard and they don't know where she is. She just goes for walks. She sits on the trees in the middle of the night. And they don't know where she is. And then when they end up finding her, subhanAllah, she's in the middle of a graveyard. I had a brother from London. And may Allah protect us from this because it's very, very serious. A brother from London, he would lose his mind and then he would wake up in the middle of the forest and he would be completely naked. But he didn't remember what had happened for the last like three hours. And so subhanAllah, this person poses a risk to himself and a risk to others as well. In this situation, it's extremely important that we have the Ruqya done. 
when is Rukya required for magic? Subhanallah, we could go and we could spend hours and hours and hours discussing the different types of magic. The types of magic which separate a man from his wife. This is one of the most common ones. Or a husband uh, from his family. So the wife will do magic on her husband to keep him away from his family. She just wants him all to herself. Or we have the ruqya, uh, sorry, the magic which puts a block on marriage. We have the magic which puts a block on somebody studying and they always start th something but they're never able to finish it. We have the magic which can put uh, somebody out of work. So for example, uh, in the night time he'll be awake. But when it comes to the daylight hours when it's time to work, he is overcome with sleep and he physically can't lift himself out of his bed. All of these ikhwani are different types of magic. Then we have the magic which is simply to try and destroy a person, to, de to try and kill a person. I had an amazing case, ikhwani, subhanallah, an amazing case. It was of a sister and this sister, she walks into the house. She walks into the house and she begins sniffing around literally like a dog. Literally the way, you know, like a sniffer dog is sniffing around and she begins sniffing around. So we take her inside and I asked the brother, what's wrong with her? He says that the doctors gave her one week to live or a few days to live. Her heart efficiency went down to 5%. 5% and the doctor said, there's no way you're going to live. There's no way you're going to live past a week or a couple of weeks. This was six months ago after she started having the ruqya. And it turned out that there was a jinn and the jinn was playing with the vowels of her heart preventing the blood from reaching certain parts of her heart. And so when the doctors would do their tests, it looked like a heart condition. And so based on this heart condition, what they saw, they gave her just a few days to live. So subhanAllah, ikhwani, again, we as Muslims, we should not put our ultimate trust in the doctors as well, because life and death is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And based on this, they gave her a few weeks and this has been now over six months, over six months. And it turns out that this jinn, it would sit in the sister's back and then they would interfere with the sister's heart. And this is very, very common, Ikhwani, very, very common, very, very common. And for those people who are suffering with magic, I advise you do not put it off because sometimes you'll be contacted by a, a person and they are afflicted with magic and you say to them get a cure as soon as possible do something as soon as possible and they don't do it Ikhwani what actually begins to happen is the magic jumps from the parents to the children the magic jumps from the parents to the children so many a time I'll have people ringing me and saying I have three children all of them are disabled Firstly, you remind them to have sabr for the sake of Allah and to place their trust in Allah. But you dig a little deeper and you ask them questions about themselves. It turns out they themselves are afflicted with magic. Just the other day, I think it was yesterday, a sister rang me and said, overnight, three of my children have de developed schizophrenia. For the first 10, 15 years of their life, they are absolutely fine. Overnight, all three of them develop schizophrenia. Ikhwani, this is something which medicine cannot explain. And this is why we need to come back to the Qur'an and use the Qur'an as a healing and as a cure. When is Ruqya required, Ikhwani, for magic? If you're somebody and you suspect that there's a member of your household is afflicted with magic, how can you, you know, get some signs? So for example, if the person they're always complaining about dreams or if this is your case, you're always having scary dreams and you're dreaming of dogs and animals which are attacking you. You see yourself surrounded in pools of blood. You see yourself being attacked by predatory animals. You see yourself wandering in the wilderness and then you fall down dead or you see a lot of dead bodies in your dreams. These are very clear signs and this is a mercy from Allah. Allah will never allow a person to be afflicted except that Allah will show you clear signs. Clear signs, whether it be in a sleeping state, so in your dreams. During the daytime, a very common thing is you see something or you think that you've seen something, but it, you sort of look back and it's not there. So you see a shadow moving or uh, again, I've, I've had people and they say blood is all over the doors of our houses. So when we wake up, all of the doors of the houses are covered in blood. 
covered in blood. And again, this is all the shayateen. What are they trying to do? They're trying to make you feel scared. They're trying to put fear in your heart. The second that you begin to fear the shayateen, your defenses go down. Your defenses drop and then they can possess you. They can enter into your body. But Allah says, وَلَا تَخْشَوْهُمْ وَخْشَوْنِي But don't fear them, fear me. And Allah says that the plot of shaitan is da'if. The plot of shaitan is weak. So whenever anything like this happens, I always say to people, if this is happening to you, anytime something like this happens, make wudu and pray two rakahs. Because what the jinn will begin to understand is, when I give him an evil dream, when I give him some form of prodding or poking, he goes and makes wudu and he prays. I'm actually pushing him closer to Allah. The further I'm trying to push him away, he is actually coming closer to Allah. And within a couple of weeks, these things will stop. Within a couple of weeks, these things will stop. Other abnormal things, Ikhwani, is people going to the toilet. And this will seem crazy and it, will, it may even seem funny, but there was a doctor, a doctor, a medical doctor. And he came to me and he said, I pass stools 11 times in a day. I go to the toilet and I pass stools 11 times in a day. He said, I visited the physician and he said that you should be dead by now. How is this possible? How is this possible? And you also get, A'udhu Billah Min Dhalik, you also get jinn sod sodomizing men. So male jinn and the brothers are being unfortunately sodomized by these male jinn, by these male shayateen. And this is a reality. This is a reality and this is something that we have to deal with because unfortunately this is very common and very prevalent in our society. Other things, Ikhwani, when dealing with magic, when dealing with magic, magic comes in different forms. So the magic may be ingested in a person's food. This is the most common form of magic which people do. They will put the magic into your food. Somebody bought me a book. And he said that this was belonged to my grandmother. This belonged to my grandmother. She's passed away now. We were cleaning her things out and we found this book. In this book, this was a book of magic. And it said that if you want to separate a man from his wife, what do you do? You take some pork. And I'm just explaining this to you to show you the filthy nature of magic. You take some pork. You take some beef. You allow the meat to rot. You allow the meat. You leave it out and you allow it to rot. Maggots will form and then one set of the maggots will eat the other set. What you do is you take the set that survives, you put them into a blender and then you do your magic on these and this will become into a powdered form and you sprinkle this onto the people's food. You sprinkle this onto the people's food and this is how magic is done. Other times, Ikhwani, what will the people do? They will take an item of your clothing, they will take a part of your hair and this is how the Prophet ﷺ had magic done on him. He would comb his beard and there was hair on his beard. And a, a, a Jewish man, he came, he took it, he took the hair, he managed to find the comb, he tied it into knots, he put it into the skull of a hyena and then they buried it in a well. And the magic was done on the Prophet ﷺ. So he would wake up and he would think that he had had relations with his wife but in actual fact, he hadn't had relations with his wife. And this was going on for a period of time. So subhanAllah, we have to understand that even the Prophet ﷺ had magic done against him. So me and you, Ikhwani, we shouldn't feel safe. We shouldn't feel invincible just because we pray five times a day. We should be uh, very vigilant. So if somebody comes to your house and is walking around, etc., be very, very vigilant. Ikhwani, I'm going to save evil eye to the end because I want to put a bit more emphasis on evil eye because this is something I haven't really spoken about in the videos or anything like this. So inshallah, we will speak in a bit more emphasis about evil eye and we'll be a bit more specific. With regards to Ruqya, Ikhwani, people, and I want to fix this misconception, people come to you and they rely upon the Raqi. They rely upon you, so they'll say, yes, I've seen your videos, you know, and I'm like, okay, so does that mean the cure is in my hands? And they will come to you and I'll say, have you been to Raqis? And they'll say, yes, I've been to this one and this one and this one. And they've been to every Raqi in the country. And I say, you know what the main problem is? Is your attitude. Your main problem is your attitude. 
you are going from person to person thinking that the cure lies with the individual. In actual fact, you need to go back to the Creator and rely upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And those people, I actually refuse to do ruqya on them. Because I say, your attitude is not correct. Rely on Allah. So people come, ikhwani, and if somebody is suffering with magic, it's very, very rare, it's very unlikely that you're going to get rid of the magic on the first session. So what I actually do is I put the people on a plan. So I'll say, look, you are afflicted with magic and I am not the one who's going to live in your pocket and recite on you every day. You're going to go back home. You need to put the plan into practice. Just like when you go to a doctor, he will diagnose you, but then he will give you a treatment. You have to go away, put that treatment into practice. You can't keep going back to the doctor because the doctor is not going to keep putting the tablet in your mouth. You yourself have to put your treatment into practice. So I'm going to mention now, bi-idhnillahi ta'ala, the ruqya plan that I put the people on. And inshallah, if anybody is suffering, you can put them on a similar plan and you can inshallah put yourself on a similar plan as well. The first thing and the most important thing, know your aqeedah. This comes before anything else. Know your aqeedah. Know your aqeedah, know your religion. You must seek knowledge about your religion. I was doing ruqya on a sister for ages and ages, a lengthy period of time, and she wouldn't really react. So one session I said, sister, before we start, tell me, where is Allah? She went crazy. She went crazy because this is part of our aqeedah. I said, tell me, what are the pillars of Iman? What are the pillars of Islam? What is Iman? She was going crazy just because I was asking her. And then when I was teaching her and I was telling her the answers, the jinn was going insane and the jinn was saying, I make her forget these things. She knows them, but I make her forget these things. So Ikhwani, from this, the first point, know your aqeedah. The second thing is you must be praying five times a day. You must be praying five times a day. If somebody doesn't pray five times a day, I don't make ruqya on them. I say, don't waste my time. You're not willing to put the time and effort into pray five times a day and now you're looking for a cure. You're trying to run before you can even crawl. Pray five times a day and you may find that your illness will get better. But having said this, having said this, there are some people, they're not able to pray five times a day. They're not able to pray. So for example, uh, I had one patient, she would stand on the, on the prayer mat and as soon as she would say Allahu Akbar, she would faint. She would faint. How do we expect this person now to pray? How do we expect this person to pray or to do the ruqya on themselves? This is where you need to contact a raqi. The third thing is making the adhkar. So especially after fajr prayer, there are those adhkar which you make at fajr time. You are protected until maghrib time. You make those adhkar at maghrib time. You are protected until fajr time. So it's like 24 hour round the clock protection. And there are those times, Ikhwani, where the person has a jinn or the person is afflicted with magic and the jinn is looking a way to enter into their body. So what the, the jinn do, they will try and like hover around the person and they'll give them problems, external jinn first. If the person is praying and the person knows their aqeedah, the jinn won't be able to enter into them in a lot of cases. There have been times where the jinn has returned and the person was not afflicted with magic because the jinn, subhanAllah, and this is documented in books, that the jinn went back to the sahir and says, this person is always in a state of wudu, he's always doing his adhkar, he's always making dhikr. I simply can't enter into this person. I simply can't enter into this person. I can't fulfill my mission because he's always in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you have or you are displaying the signs of magic, eat seven ajwa dates every morning. Seven ajwa dates every morning. In Sahih Bukhari, it's recorded that the Prophet ﷺ, he said, he who eats seven ajwa dates every morning will not be affected by poison or magic on the day that he eats them. He will not be affected by poison or magic on the day that he eats them. So eat the, uh, the ajwa dates. The fifth or the sixth thing, fasting on Mondays and Thursdays. This is something we should all be doing anyway. It's a sunnah to fast on Mondays and Thursdays. 
But remember that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said that the shaitan, he flows through the sun, through the veins of the son of Adam like blood. And the scholars have mentioned that when you're fasting, your veins constrict, there is not, the, there's, there's less room for the shaitan to flow through your body. So by fasting, you're actually weakening your shaitan. When you combine the fasting with hijama, with cupping, when you combine the fasting with cupping, this is extremely effective by the permission of Allah. The Prophet ﷺ, he said in a hadith which is reported by Ibn Abbas, recorded by Imam al-Bukhari, he said, healing is in three things, drinking honey, the incision, the cuts of the kappa, and cauterizing with fire. But I forbid my ummah to use cauterizing. So the Prophet ﷺ, he said, healing is in three things, drinking honey, the cutting of the kappa, and cauterization, where they, where they cauterize you with fire. But he says, I don't like that for my ummah. We are forbidden to have cauterization. The point here, Ikhwani, what does cupping do? It removes blood. There have been times where a person is possessed. The jinn comes out in the cupping because it was flowing through the blood at that point and the cupping removed that blood and the jinn came out in the blood. So the person didn't even need ruqya, yet the jinn came out in the cupping. And the Prophet ﷺ, he also said, which is in a hadith which is Bukhari and Muslim, if there is anything good in the medicines with which you treat yourselves, it is in the, cupping, uh, the cutting of the kappa or a drink of honey or cauterization with fire, but I do not like to be cauterized. Where do we have cupping? The main point that you have cupping is on the top of your head for somebody who is afflicted with magic. For the brothers, this is fine. We can shave our heads and we can do that. For the sisters, unfortunately, you have to shave your head as well. But I don't mean the whole head. You just shave a tiny patch on the top of your head. And inshallah for the sisters, it's not visible when the rest of your hair is, is over that. And it's very, very beneficial. So sometimes you're doing ruqya on an individual, two weeks, three weeks, four sessions, five sessions. You hit a brick wall. You say to the person, go and have cupping. And it really kickstarts the treatment by the permission of Allah. The eighth thing that we should do is increase in dua. Increase in dua. Aisha radiallahu anha, when she was reporting or she was narrating about the illness of the Prophet ﷺ when he had magic, she says that he would recite Quran and then make dua. And then he would recite and make dua. And he would recite and make dua. The point here, she repeats dua over and over again. This proves that the Prophet ﷺ, he would make a huge amount of dua when he was suffering with magic. We have to understand. Allah says, وَمَا هُمْ بِضَارِينَ بِهِ مِنْ أَحَدٍ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ They do not harm anybody except by the permission of Allah. So know that if the person is suffering, this is a test, it's a trial from Allah. But if Allah wills, He will simply say, be and their illness will be destroyed or their illness will be removed. So make a lot of dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He cures you and He heals you. Another thing, the ninth thing is give a lot of money in charity or give a lot of charity seeking a means, seeking a, a way of wasila to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is one of the permissible ways of wasila, of tawassul. This is one of the permissible ways you, you seek the approach to Allah through good deeds. So give in charity. It may be, Ikhwani, that one sin that you are committing or that you are regular upon, it holds back your, the shifa from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So whenever, if somebody comes to me and says, oh, Akhi, an hour, a year and a half, two years have gone by, I'm doing ruqya and I'm not being cured. I always start off with, learn your aqidah and then stop indulging in your sins that you are persisting upon. And another brother who does ruqya, he was telling me about this and he's a close brother. He was telling me, and you brothers will know him, Muhammad Tim Humble. He was saying that there was a sister and they were doing ruqya on her, but she wasn't getting better. Why? Because she was texting men. She was texting men. The day that she stopped and she made tawbah, she was cured on that same day. So subhanallah, one sin may stop the shifa of Allah from coming down. So if you are regular or you're persistent in some form of sin, then rectify your affairs with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whether that be music or movies or whatever it is, rectify your affairs and you'll actually find, as Allah says, 
you may hate something, but it's good for you. So subhanAllah, how many people, they are, were afflicted with magic as a result of that, they become practicing Muslims. They were afflicted by jinn possession. As a result of that, they become practicing Muslims. The tenth thing, place your trust in Allah and not in His creation. Place your trust in Allah and not in His creation. Before I do a ruqya session, about 20 minutes, I give the person da'wah. I give them da'wah and one of the key things I say is, don't you dare place your trust in me because I can't benefit myself and I certainly can't benefit you. And I always, always am able to tell from the way a person speaks and their attitude when they come in. This person, yeah, he's trusting in me or he's relying upon me. And this person, no, his tawakkul is in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And by Allah, the difference and the effectiveness of the ruqya is clear. I'm reciting the same ayat. My intention is the same. But subhanallah, <coughs> the person who relies on Allah, the ruqya is so much more effective. So much more effective than the person who relies upon me. Because I can't benefit myself, so how, how am I going to benefit them? Ikhwani goes without saying, number 11, there should be no da'weed, no amulets, none of this in the house. You cannot expect the shifa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to come down if you are disobeying Allah. The Prophet alayhi salam, he said, seek a cure, seek a cure for your illnesses, but do not seek a cure from the haram means. Do not seek a cure in those means which are impermissible. So in seeking a cure, this is not permissible. I went to a house and on the front door and the back door, they had a bunch of amulets and they were tied up, you know, it looked like there was diamonds in there. This is how they, they were tied up. And we undid it and we unraveled it and the Taweez was like six foot long, six foot long. And all it was, was calling upon the shaitan, calling upon the shaitan. And so recently the brother contacted me and he said, Akhi, we got rid of the amulets, but now there's blood on all of the doors of the house. And we're hearing noises in the house. And I said, you know why that is, don't you? Because the, shay the, the jinn or the shayateen, they were giving you trouble. You were committing shirk by calling upon the shaitan. They were happy. Now that you have got rid of the shirk, you are placing your trust in Allah. Now they want to give you trouble again. So have patience and they will realize that you are trusting in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The twelfth thing, there should be no pictures or statues on display in your house. Jibreel alayhi salam, he came down to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and told him, we, as in us angels, we do not enter a home in which there are pictures on display or there is a dog. So don't ever put your pictures on display, you know, your photo frame, your wedding day, your children, etc. Get rid of all of this. Get rid of all of this. It's not permissible. The angels won't enter into your house. Where the angels don't enter, the shayateen will enter. Uh, the 13th thing, no music or movies. This goes without saying. This goes without saying. No music or movies. Do your best. Nobody is perfect. Do your best to cut out music and movies from your life. It's very, very important, Ikhwani. The 14th thing, if you're experiencing movements in your stomach, so for example, somebody who has sihar and they have ingested it and it's in their food, when you make the ruqya, they will begin to feel movements in their stomach. One patient, their stomach began to blow up. It, it, it literally began to expand outwards. It began to bloat up like it was a sister she, and she was not pregnant, she wasn't even married and she was fine. But during the ruqya, she began to look like she was pregnant because her stomach was becoming bloated. In this instance, or for the brothers as well, the same thing happens. You're not pregnant, but it can look like you are. It can look like you are. Literally, you will have a big bump. Literally, you will get a big bump in your stomach. In this instance, you need to take some senna leaves. You need to take senna leaves. What this is, is a very strong laxative. Is a very, very strong laxative. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he mentions it in the prophetic medicine. In his book on the prophetic medicine, he says this is from the sunnah, to take senna leaves. And what this does is insha'Allah bi'idhnillahi ta'ala, it will wash the magic out of your stomach. It will wash the magic out of your stomach. A, and our brothers, our Arab brothers, they are very, very good at, like they have this uh, type of herbal, drink and it makes a person throw up, it makes a person vomit. 
and they put a, like a load of different uh, uh, sort of powders and, and, and um, uh, flavors and ingredients in here. What the person does, literally, you take it and it'll make you vomit like 10 or 15 times. A sister took it and she hasn't eaten lamb for 15 years. She took it and she vomited out lamb. She vomited out lamb and there was a frothy substance on the lamb that she vomited out. Because somebody had fed her lamb like 15 years ago and subhanallah, it was still in her stomach. It was still in her stomach. Ikhwani, this is just the evil nature of the sihab that will remain in a person's system. It will remain in a person's system so we need to get rid of that. And finally, Ikhwani, we need to drink as much Zamzam water as we possibly can. Get hold of some Zamzam and drink as much as you possibly can. It's mentioned in Sunan Ibn Majah uh, from Jabir Ibn Abdullah that the Prophet وسلم, he said, the water of Zamzam is for whatever it is drunk for. So whatever purpose you drink Zamzam for, it is for that purpose. So if you drink it to fill you up, you will be filled up. If you drink it to give you energy and to sustain you, you will be sustained by the permission of Allah. So make dua before you drink the Zamzam. And insha'Allah, it will bring you benefit with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I want to mention now some incorrect forms of ruqya. Some incorrect forms of ruqya. The first thing, Ikhwani, is don't talk to the jinn too much. Because what you have to understand is by you talking, what are you not doing? You're not reciting. So they will get you into a lengthy conversation lengthy conversation and they will speak about the Illuminati and they will speak about all sorts of conspiracy theories just to keep you going. The longer you talk, the shorter you recite. So it's enough for you to say, why are you here? How long have you been here? What's your mission? Leave. And that's as much information as you need. Some scholars, some scholars, there's a Sheikh uh, Hafizullah in Medina, he allows trying to give da'wah to the jinn, trying to give da'wah to the jinn. But Ikhwani, don't bother. Don't bother because they are so stubborn. I had a Hindu jinn uh, two weeks ago. A Hindu jinn was, and it, was, it came in a sister. And I tried to give it da'wah. Do you think that you were just created with no play, you know, reason? And, and you're not going to be returned to us? We have not created mankind and, and, and jinn except to worship us. Islam. The only religion acceptable to Allah is Islam. Uh, you know, Allah will never forgive the one who commits shirk. All of this. Try and give it da'wah, da'wah, da'wah. And it just wasn't accepting. Do you want to accept Islam? No. Okay, give it more ayat. Do you want to accept Islam? No. I said, okay. I tell you what, you recite from your Hindu scriptures and see if anything happens to me. And then I will recite upon you from the word of Allah and let's see what happens to you. So this jinn, literally, it sounds like Dr. Zakir Naik, you know, when he quotes from the, the Hindu Vedas, etc. Started quoting from the, from the Hindu scriptures. And I was sat there and I was seeking refuge in Allah. And I said, look, nothing has happened to me now. And then I just said, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajim and began reciting. And the jinn said, you're burning me, stop, etc. So even when you are burning them and you are saying, look, when I speak to you in clear English, nothing happens. When I recite the, the Quran to you, suddenly you begin burning. This is not a normal recitation. This is recitation of Quran. And it was not interested. So I said, look, call upon all of your gods. Call upon all of your gods and tell them to pull one hair from my beard and see if they're able to do that. And this is a way of humiliating it and a way of causing pain to the jinn because literally it was like somebody was poking it and it was, it was like jumping and it was screaming. I said, look, call upon them and tell them that I'm challenging them to pull one hair from my beard and they couldn't do it. And I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to collect them all up, all of these statues which you carve from wood and stone and I'm going to smash them in front of your face. And she began to cry. I said, look, this is what you worship. These idols, these you give them, you and your forefathers give them names and then you worship them. And yet they can't bring you any benefit. You know, Allah says, O oh people, an example is presented to you. That which you worship besides Allah, it cannot create a fly 
even if all of the gods came together and they wouldn't be able to create something even as simple as a fly. Weak is the one that is worshipped and weak are the ones who worship it. And subhanAllah, it was not having any of it. It was not having any of it. So with regards to excess speaking, stay away from that. So that's one thing. Stay away from excess conversation with the, with the shayateen because they will mislead you more than you will try and give them da'wah. The second thing, Ikhwani, we have those people who engage in jinn catching. It's very big on the internet, very big on the internet, jinn catching. So he'll have like a person and the, the person is sat here and this is his jinn catcher. And so the person who's possessed will be on the other side and he'll say right now. He reads this ayah, uh, I think it's in Surah Al-Baqarah. And he, and he says, look, this now we ask Allah to bring the jinn into this person. And magically, wonderfully, subhanAllah, the jinn comes from this person into this like person who's like a gate or a portal to the shayateen. And he gives them da'wah and within 30 seconds they leave. And you think, subhanAllah, subhanAllah, you have come across a technique which none of the Salaf ever came across. You have come across a technique which is not written in the books of the scholars of the past. And now you are saying that this is from the Quran and from the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Be very, very careful with jinn catching. And it's a, it's a lengthy thing. But uh, Allah says, you know, and, and he asks the jinn, where are you, etc. And it's like he actually listens and he takes the advice of the shayateen. But Allah says that if a fasiq comes to you, fatabayyanu, seek clarification on everything that he is saying. Because you don't know, you don't know. So that's why Ikhwani, stay away from this jinn catching. Other types of um, innovated or shirki um, ruqya, the person, like I said, he will take something from you. He will say, call me back or he will ask your name. What's your name? What's your date of birth? Okay, give me a call in like two or three days time. And then he tells you exactly what's wrong with you. Again, this person is seeking the aid from the shayateen and this is not permissible. Okay, uh, I want to mention something about striking or beating. I advise you brothers and sisters to stay away from it. To stay away from it. Because especially with the media attention that's going on, people are murdering people and then they're saying, oh look, there was a, it was an exorcism ritual. And so subhanAllah, it's very, very difficult now. And people, it's not uncommon now for people to then later on, they, they, they do you for assault and these type of things. Stay away from that. There's no need. The Quran is enough. Allah says, وَنُنَزِّلُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مَا هُوَ شِفَاءٌ وَرَحْمَةٌ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ And Allah says, لَوْ أَنزَلْنَا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ عَلَى جَبَلْ لَرَعَيْتَهُ خَاشِعًا مُتَصَدِّعًا مِنْ خَشْيَةِ اللَّهِ If we were to reveal this Quran on a mountain, the mountain would turn to dust out of the uh, fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we don't need to beat because the Quran is enough. So stay away from these things. Ikhwani, let's talk about Ain now. Let's talk about evil eye. Because I think that this is something which I think there's a lot of misconceptions about. And it's not really mentioned in a huge amount of detail in the Sunnah or in the Quran. But it is mentioned in the Quran. It is mentioned in the Quran. Where is evil eye mentioned in the Quran? Ya'qub alayhi salam, when his 11 sons were going to Egypt, they were going to Egypt in Surah Yusuf, in the 67th ayah of the Quran. Ya'qub alayhi salam, he said to his sons, O oh my sons, do not enter from one gate. Do not enter Egypt, all of you together, but rather enter from different gates. And he said, and I cannot avail you against the decree of Allah alone. The decision is only for Allah. Upon Him I have relied and upon Him let those who have reliance place their reliance. Ikhwani, if when you look at the books of Tafsir, uh, it's mentioned from Ibn Abbas, Muhammad Ibn Kab, Mujahid, uh, Qatada and various others of the Mufassirin. They state, Ya'qub alayhi salam, he feared evil eye for his sons. Because they are 11 of them and they are all brothers and they are upright, big, strong, beautiful men. So he didn't want them to enter from one gate because he feared the evil eye for them. He feared the evil eye for them. But look, a point of Aqeedah. He says, وَمَا أُغْنِي عَنْكُمْ مِنَ اللَّهِ مِنْ شَيْءٍ And I cannot know, my sons, that I cannot avail you against the decree of Allah at all. So, place your tawakkul in Allah. 
you find people and they get very shaky, you know, they say, oh, I'm always feeling, fearing evil eye. I'm always fearing evil eye. Somebody's going to give me evil eye. Don't be excessive. Don't show off. Do your adhkar and then pray, place your trust in Allah. This is what Yaqub alayhi salam, he was teaching his sons. Oh my sons, take your precautions. Don't enter from one gate. But know at the same time, if something evil or evil eye is going to befall you, I cannot help you against that. And he says, let the ones who place their trust, place their trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. In Sahih, of course, we also have in Surah, uh, surah Falaq, وَمِن شَرِّ حَاسِدٍ إِذَا حَسَدٍ When we are seeking refuge in Allah from the evil of the one who envies when he en uh, from the evil of the envier when he envies. What is evil eye, Ikhwani? How do we detect evil eye? I had uh, somebody ring me yesterday. My son, he had 14 GCSEs. Seven A stars and seven A's, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. Now, and everybody was amazed. Now, he's dropped out of university. He, has, he, 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 he can't think, he's very slow. How, how clever he used to be, this is how now, how slow his mind has become. And everybody was amazed and everybody was praising him. Everybody was just amazed at this person's intellect. And so subhanAllah, now as clever as he was, this is now he's become that, uh, shall we say, uh, not able, not mentally able anymore. So evil eye will usually afflict one thing in particular. So for example, if a person is an amazing craftsman and the people give him evil eye, when he comes to work, he won't be able to work. He won't be able to work. And when you're reciting on this person, he's not reacting to the ayat of sihr. He's not reacting to the general ayat of shifa. Or he's not really reacting to those ayat which are pertaining to a jinn possession. And so subhanAllah, it's a very difficult one to place your finger upon. It's very likely that this person, he is suffering from evil eye. It's narrated in Bukhari and in Muslim on the authority of our mother Aisha radiallahu anha that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa she, she says, the Messenger of Allah used to tell me to recite Ruqya for protection against the evil eye. So even the Prophet alayhi salam, he would seek refuge and he would order his companions to seek refuge in Allah from the evil eye. And I want to mention one particular incident now. And this is from the Sunnah and it's an authentic, Imam Ahmad records it, Imam Malik, and Nasa'i, Ibn Hibban, and it's from Sahal Ibn Hanif. And he says that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they were on a journey and they're traveling towards Makkah. There, this man who narrates this, he's narrating this himself. He says, Sahal Ibn Hanif, he was having a ghusl. So he was standing by some, like a river and he was taking a wash. Obviously he'd taken his top off and this man, he had a, a good body and he had very, uh, yani he had, had like bright skin and he was very muscly. So he was some, somebody who had an attractive body. So he says, and he was a handsome white skinned man with beautiful skin. One of the companions, he looked at him whilst he, will do, whilst he was doing the ghusl. So this man is washing, this companion is washing. Another companion looks at him and he said, I have never seen such beautiful skin as this, not even the skin of a virgin. And Sahal, he immediately fell down to the ground. So I want you to imagine this. The companion is taking a wash. He doesn't know anybody is watching him. This man, he is watching him and he says, SubhanAllah, or he says this amazing skin. Immediately that companion, he drops down. Like somebody shot him, he's dropped down. And some of the scholars, they mention evil eye is like an arrow and it hits his target and he dropped down immediately. So they went to the Messenger of Allah alayhi salam and they came and said, O Messenger of Allah, can you do anything for Sahal? Because by Allah, he cannot even raise his head. This is a man who was muscly and he was fit and he was young and he dropped down and he wasn't even able to raise his head. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, look at his words, he said, do you accuse anybody? Who do you accuse of doing this to you? Who are you accusing? So it's something which is evil. Who are you accusing? So it's like somebody steals something from you. Who do you accuse? Somebody's wronged you. Who do you accuse? So the Prophet ﷺ said, who do you accuse? They said, and they mentioned the name, Amir ibn Rabi'ah. And 
he looked at him. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he called Amir and he rebuked him strongly. He told him off and he said, "Why would one of you kill your brother? If you see something that you like, then pray for blessings for him. Say, Masha Allah, Tabarakallah, whatever it is." Ask Allah to bless it for him. This closes the door to evil eye dead. If you see something that you like and you feel in your heart now something is coming, make sure it's Masha Allah. Make sure it's Tabarakallah. Just invoke Allah's blessings upon that thing. Make dua for your brother. This will close the door to evil eye. Then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he ordered Amir, he said, wash yourself for him. So he washed his face, his hands, his forearms, his knees and the sides of his feet and inside his izhar, in the vessel. Then that water was poured over him and the man poured it over his head from behind and he did that. Then Sahil got up and joined the people like there was nothing wrong with him at all. He couldn't even raise his head. But they found out who was the one who did the evil eye. They told him to like do wudu, collected the wudu water, poured it over his head and the man got up like there was nothing wrong. In the Maj, Sheikh Muqbil rahimahullah, he would have his classes of hadith. He would have his classes of hadith and uh, the brother narrates this, he was in there. Sheikh Muqbil, he picks on the brother from the crowd rahimahullah and he says, narrate to us such and such a hadith. So the brother stands up now in a crowd of hundreds of people. The brother stands up. And he says, it was narrated on the authority of so-and-so who heard it from so-and-so. And he gives a whole sanat, he gives a whole chain of narration. And then he gives the matan, he gives the text. And he finishes and he passes out. He passes out. The Shaykh, uh, rahimahullah, he ordered the guards, he said, lock the doors. They all did wudu and they collected the water and they poured it onto the brother and he got up like there was nothing wrong. So subhanallah, this is the reality of evil eye, Ikhwani. The reality of evil eye. And uh, Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen, Rahimahullah, he was asked the question, can the non-Muslims give a person evil eye? Is it possible for the non-Muslims to give us evil eye? And he used as dalil to say yes, the ayah in Surah Qalam, which is the 68th Surah of the Quran, the 51st ayah, Indeed, those who disbelieve would almost make you slip with their eyes. So when they look at you, they give you that look, they would almost make you slip with their eyes. What to do now, Ikhwani, if you feel you have been afflicted with evil eye? The first thing, if you know the person who has done it to you, if you know the person who has done it to you, go to that person, ask for him to make wudu and you collect the water. And the Prophet ﷺ, he told us, it's an order. If your brother asks you to give, you, to give him your wudu water, you must give it. You must give it. But the thing is, Ikhwani, unfortunately, in today's day, due to our ignorance, if somebody asked for our wudu water, we'd say, you're crazy. I'm not giving you my wudu water. You're going to do magic on me or something like this. So this is uh, due to our own ignorance, our own lack of knowledge. A brother very close to me, a brother very close to me, He's standing in the masjid, some brothers come in and I'm there and they comment on his beard. He goes home, his beard is falling out in clumps and lumps. He contacts the brothers, mashallah, practicing brothers, they were aware of the hadith. They gathered all of their wudu water and he took it in the bottle and somebody came, his wife came from behind and poured it on him while he was in the bath over his head. Mashallah, the brother's beard regrew and there was nothing wrong with it. So the first thing, Ask if you know the person for wudu. So do that. The second thing is recite ruqya upon yourself. Recite ruqya upon yourself. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he would recite things like uh, Bismillahi arqika min kulli shay'in yu'adhik, etc. He would recite these type of, uh, of, of uh, ruqya and you should do this. As regards to ikhwani, unfortunately some people today they mention like take this person's urine, take this person's waste. There's no, uh, there's no basis for this in the in the deen whatsoever. There's no basis for this in the deen whatsoever. Uh, handy tip: What do you do if you suspect somebody and you've asked them for their wudu water, but they haven't given it to you? What what can you do? Some of the scholars mention 
<laughs> it sounds crazy, but some of the scholars mention, and it has worked by the permission of Allah. Feed them a date. Feed them a date. And when the date stone comes out from their mouth, keep that date stone. Take some water, dip the date stone which has been in their mouth into that water and then do the same thing, pour that water over your head. For the sisters, some of the scholars have even gone and they've mentioned, take a bucket of water. So for example, there was a sister, she uh, became pregnant, she gave birth by the permission of Allah, everything was fine. A lot of women came to visit her. Somebody gave her evil eye. She was unable to feed her child naturally. So they feared for her evil eye. So what they did was, all of the women who were there, they uh, uh, took a big bucket, they took their shoes and dipped their shoes into the water. Why? Because on the underside of the shoe or on the underside of your heel, it's rubbing, there's going to be an element of sweat. I.e. you need a part of that person. You need a part of the sweat, be it from their mouth or a saliva from their mouth or from their, you know, from their sandals, dipped it in the bucket and they poured it over the woman and she was able to breastfeed again by the permission of Allah. So subhanAllah, Ikhwani, it's very, very real. I want to mention something here because there's a lot of young brothers as well. Weddings. We have massive weddings. A thousand, two thousand people and we, we have extravagant weddings, you spend a lot of money, you are opening yourself to evil eye in a big way. Your immediate family will say, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. But whilst you're on the stage in your, in your flash clothes and you're, you know, you're posing for the camera and all the boys are on the stage, everybody does it, Ikhwani. You know, it's reality. How many of those people though will be looking at you and they are feeling jealous of you? They are feeling jealous of you and they don't make dua for you. They don't invoke Allah's blessings upon you, upon your marriage as well. They are struggling to get married, you got married. The person is jealous. The same thing, Ikhwani, be very, very careful. So the first thing, don't be overly extravagant and don't show off. Stick to the sunnah, keep it simple, there's more barakah insha'Allah. The second thing, seek refuge in Allah. أَعُوذُ بِكَلِمَاتِ اللَّهِ التَّامَّ مِن كُلِّ شَيْطَانٍ وَهَمَّ مِن كُلِّ عَيْنٍ لَامَّ I seek refuge in Allah from every evil eye. For Hassan and Hussein, the grandchildren of the Prophet وسلم, he would place his hands on, on their heads and then he would seek refuge for them in the perfect words of Allah from every shaitan, from every animal that stings and every evil eye. So seek refuge for your children as well, morning and evening. So seek refuge in Allah. Do not be of those people who openly display your, uh, display your wealth or be extremely extravagant. And the third thing, if you yourself see your brother and he is doing well, he is successful, invoke Allah's blessings, make dua for that person, close the door to evil eye. Close the door to evil eye because Ikhwani, it's very, very dangerous and it's very, very deadly and it ruins people's lives. So. And this is something blameworthy and only, and people say, I had a question once, is it permissible to give evil eye to the non-Muslims? You know, like you look at them and you're trying to give them evil eye. <laughs> Ikhwani, this is not possible. Evil eye doesn't necessarily just happen with a look. Evil eye can also happen, you hear some good news, you become jealous. It's as a result of envy and hatred in the heart. It's a disease of the heart in and of itself. This is something blameworthy. So you know we have different types of knowledge. Some knowledge you can seek and it's, uh, and it's, it's, it's good. Other types of knowledge, seeking that knowledge in and of itself is blameworthy. So seeking knowledge of magic for argument's sake, in and of itself from beginning to end is blameworthy. The same thing with evil eye. It's a disease of the heart. Somebody has hatred and envy and malice towards you. This is a disease of the heart. So the answer is, it's absolutely not permissible to try and give somebody evil eye because this is a disease of the heart. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from jinn and magic and evil eye. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those people who use the Quran as a shifa for all of our illnesses. And finally, Ikhwani, I want to encourage you brothers to do ruqya. I want to encourage you brothers to do ruqya. I don't just mean you yani, just start up a Rukya clinic and you don't have any, uh, any, uh, any experience or you haven't sat down with somebody and spoken to them and asked them questions etc. 
but for your own families, for your relatives. Everybody here now, as long as you have the correct aqidah, you can recite Quran, you have the ability to at the least make ruqya upon yourself. And more than that, for your family members, for your children as well. Because, ikhwani, for one person, you might receive 20 phone calls in a day. 20 phone calls in a day. And subhanAllah, it's too much for one person to deal with from all over the country. So we need more brothers who are getting out there to do the ruqya. Now, with a view to this, if there are some brothers and indeed some sisters who are interested and the brothers allow it and they will, they will facilitate it, then I don't mind coming down and doing like a full day workshop with some brothers and sisters. But the single condition is, if you come to that workshop, then you need to get out and aid the community who are suffering. So I don't want anybody to come to that workshop and then they just keep that knowledge to themselves. Rather, if you come to that workshop, we will talk in detail about magic, how it's done, how to fight against it, in detail about the symptoms and the different types of magic. We'll talk about in detail about jinn and their reality and the way they are, how to combat it, etc. And we'll talk about in detail about protecting the house and stuff. Go into more detail, inshallah. If there are brothers and sisters who are interested, then let's go ahead and do that but the condition is you need to then go out and help people so if somebody rings me from Halifax Huddersfield Leeds I'll point them in your direction so if there are people who want to do that inshallah then contact the brothers and we can take it from there bi-ithnillahi ta'ala subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik ashadu wa la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk you mentioned at the start of the, the talk that the, the people who are going back to Mm -hmm. And the Prophet recognized that and said, look, if, if there's no shirk, so it's okay. So I'm just wondering how that compares to some of the other examples of the jinn catchers that you were referring to today. If they're not, if it's not, if they're not indulging in shirk, mm -hmm. would they not be able to use, use that as a, as, a, as a means to justify what they're doing? Okay. Um, do you want me to repeat the question for the sisters? Okay, the brother's basically asking, um, we mentioned in the hadith which is in, in uh, Sahih Muslim that, that some people came to the Prophet salam and they mentioned their ruqyas to him and he said look as long as it doesn't involve shirk then we you know I will allow this the, f the first thing and the most important thing to recognize is that the Arabs at the time of Jahiliyyah they believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they recognized Allah Jalla wa Ala as their Lord, but they associated partners with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala at the same time. So Allah mentioned the Quran: If you ask them who created the heavens and the earth, who sends down the the, the rain, who gives life and death, la yaqulun Allah. They will say Allah. So the point here: when they came to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, they mentioned their their, their ruqya to him. He allowed that which was calling upon Allah Subhanahu wa Taala alone. Seeking the aid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. As for those which involve calling upon Allah and Uzza, etc., He forbade that for them. He did not allow that for them. That's the first thing. So, uh, they, in, in essence, they were actually calling upon Allah, but they weren't calling upon Allah with any set dua mentioned in the Sunnah at this stage. But later on, we have enough from the Sunnah of the Prophet, وسلم, enough adhkar, enough recitation, enough ayat. That should be sufficient for us. That's the first thing. The second thing with regards to jinn catching, it's extremely important that we first look at the reality of the shayateen. So if somebody is, if a jinn has possessed a person, that jinn by definition is not going to be a righteous jinn. It's not going to be a Muslim jinn which you can trust upon. The hadith uh, Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, he was guarding the bayt al-mal of the Muslims. A man came to him the first night. Abu Huraira caught him and the man said, oh look, I have a family, I need to feed them, etc. Abu Huraira said, okay, let you go. Second night, the man comes back. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu catches him. I'm going to take you to the messenger of Allah. No, I have a family, etc. Let's him go. The third night, Abu Hurair radiallahu anhu catches him and says, Wallahi, I'm going to take you to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa The man says, look, I will teach you something, which if you recite it, then Allah will uh, uh, assign for you a guard. If you recite it at night time, Allah will assign for you a guard to protect, protect you till the morning. He teaches him Ayatul Kursi. The Prophet alayhi salam, because Jibreel alayhi salam has already brought this down through wahi, through revelation, the Prophet alayhi salam says, who visited you these last three days, O Abu Huraira? 
Abu Hurairah explains the whole situation. He says, that was a shaitan. And he spoke the truth, but he is a liar. He spoke the truth on this occasion, but he is a liar. The point is from this, we have the default setting, if you like, of the shayateen. They are liars. So who is, when the shaitan comes to you, or, or sorry, not pointing at the brother, but when the, when, the, when the jinn is there and you are speaking and saying, you know, who's the sahir and you know, you leave and then bring the other jinn with that sahir and we're going to destroy him. Subhanallah, who has authenticated that that jinn is telling you the truth? Because Allah says, if a fasiq comes to you, somebody who you can see and he b brings you some knowledge, Fatabayun, see clarification. How we see how can we see clarification on something we can't even see? Something we don't even know its reality. How many times have I been to somebody and the jinn says, There's 20 of us in this, in this person's body? You say, Look, I'm not interested. Give it a rest and you continue with the recitation. And you say in the end, you say, You're one jinn, aren't you? Because yeah, I'm one jinn. I was trying to mislead you. So the fact is, Ikhwani, they are liars. They are liars and when you are, you know, you're asking them too many questions and you're telling them bring the sahir, it's the same jinn and you're, you're the one being played for a fool. And the thing is, ruqya is what is from the Quran and from the sunnah, inshaAllah. And there's none of the salaf have practiced this. And I've actually done a whole video, like 40 minutes refuting this. Uh, and it's enough for us that it wasn't practiced by the, the salaf. And we can't, you know, make any uh, qiyas, we can't make any analogical deduction. So for example, uh, when it comes to, you might say, how, where do you get blowing in the water and giving the person the water to drink? We have various narrations which would say the Prophet salam or others from the Salaf blew into the person's mouth. If that's a sister, I can't get close to her and open your mouth, sister, blow into her mouth. So I blow into either her husband's mouth and tell her husband to blow into her mouth or blow into the water and say, drink this, Ukhti. Or blow into Zamzam water, make dua and give it to her. And we have clear proofs for that, like the hadith that we mentioned, etc. So we try and stick within a, a, within a framework because the second that you start going too much and you become too free, you're going to start bringing in things and now your ruqya is going to be beating and, and questioning and da'wah and there's no Quran left anymore. So you're going to deviate and shaitan will, the deviation will start small but it slowly, slowly, slowly you'll begin to deviate more and more. So it's better that we remain fixed, recitation of Quran, adhkar and maybe a little bit of da'wah if it doesn't work then we should stop that and Allah knows best. But it's, it's something inshallah which uh, is, is not from the sunnah to do. <coughs> Other religions also perform exorcisms. Um, so, for example, like the Vatican, where they're using shirk mm -hmm. to perform this, how is it possible? I mean, you know, you, you hear they're using holy water to burn the spirit and this idea. How, apart from the Quran, how can? Very good question. How does non-Muslim or the or the exorcisms of the of the non-Muslims work? Because the jinn sometimes they do leave. How does this work? Ikhwani, we have to break it down. Let's break it right down to the, to the core. The aim of the shaitan is to take as many of us with him to Jahannam as possible. This is his aim. Oh Allah, because you have allowed me to go astray, I will sit on your straight path and I will come to, to them from in front of them, from behind them, from their right and from their left. And I will mislead all of them except for the ones whom you have mercy on, oh Allah. And you will find that most of them are not grateful to you. So the point is, the mission of shaitan to take as many people to Jahannam with him as possible. Shaitan knows when a person commits shirk, Allah will never forgive that person. Allah will never forgive that person. It's the same thing when you go and you say, how is it that when a person says, Ya Abdul Qadir Al Jilani, Ya Ahmed Raza Khan, and the jinn leaves. How is it? Why is it? And it may begin to boggle the mind. I want to give you the example, I always use the example of a dog because they come so many times to the, in, the, in, the, in the person's dream as a dog so let's call them, in, let's use the example of a dog when a dog is barking if you throw meat to that dog, it will stop barking it will stop barking, you fed its hunger but the second you take the meat away, it's going to start barking and it starts barking harder because it knows if I bark, this person gives me what I want so the jinn 
He's a shaitan, he's an agent of shaitan. He wants to take as many people to, to Jahannam as possible. When you commit shirk, he will leave. He'll say another one bites the dust. Another one is done. That's another one for us, khalas. And when he leaves, now the person who is possessed, he will be more committed to the cause of shirk because he'll say, you know what? The Bible has to be the haqq. Because he used the Bible and the jinn left. And the jinn left. And now he's a more committed Christian than he ever was before. And as a result of that, he goes further into his shirk. And as a result of that, the mission of the shaitan is even more accomplished. And this is why when a person indulges in amulets and da'weed and calling upon the, the, the saints and the awliya and, and, and all the other people and he commits the shirk, he will be fine. But the second this person comes to tawheed, his problems will begin. That's why, because the dog knows if I start barking, he'll go back to that. I'll get fed again. So that's why I always say to people, look, if you want a quick fix, go and get a Taweez. But know that it's going to be a quick fix. The second you come back and you start relying on Allah, that Taweez is not going to benefit you. Rather, it's going to become even, even worse, even worse. So that's why there's no quick fix. You do it properly first time. And the cure is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Okay, the sister asked a question. Uh, uh, brother, after I have cupping uh, a few, uh, with a few sisters, I have after effects, for example, whisperings of shaitan, seeing things and hearing things and, and feeling fear in myself. And I start think, and I'm thinking about stopping the hijama. Why is that? Whenever a person is going and doing something on the right path, the shayateen will always come to them. So for example, I always say to the people, look, you've rang me now. Now your problems are going to start. Why? Because you're, you're, the shaitan that's with you or the sahir, he knows now this person is contacting uh, somebody who does ruqya. So now the problems, they will begin and be prepared. And I always say to the people, look, this is, you're at the foot of a very, very steep mountain now. But know that you take little steps. Don't look at it as one big mountain. Take these little steps. So sister, it may be that you are having problems with uh, the, the jinn and seeing things uh, while in an awake state. This is very much a sign of uh, sihar. You may be seeing spiders, shadows, hearing things, things may be misplaced around your house, etc. This is normally a sign of sihar. It may be just jinn living in your house or giving you issues. Normally it's a sign of sihar. But you'll even find those brothers who seek to aid people. So people who bring people to Iraqi. So there is Iraqi and there's like for example in Makkah. In Makkah there's Iraqi and he's just outside of the Haram. There's a brother from the UK, from Middlesbrough, not far from here. He takes people, he lives in Makkah now, he takes people to visit the Iraqi. The jinn, they give problems to the brother because he is bringing other people to the straight path. So the point here is the second that you go onto the straight path, the shayateen, they will give you issues. But like I mentioned, Ukhti, uh, be very patient, uh, you know, and know that in Allah Allah is with the patient. And know that after hardship comes ease, be patient, inshaAllah. I advise you to continue with the hijama. Don't give it up. Your, your problems are not with the hijama, you know, the cupping is not causing you to hear things or see things. It's the shayateen that are reacting to you, trying to put you off the cupping. So rather increase or continue with the cupping, start with the fasting and the ruqya, etc. And inshallah, like I mentioned, the closer you come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more your iman increases, the less your problems will become. Uh, and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to ease your uh, suffering. Is there any particular ayat or surahs you plan to read on yourself? Okay, the brother asked a question about any particular uh, surahs or any ayat that we can recite from the Quran. Firstly, we have those what I call like the universal uh, ayat. So that's for example, Surah Fatiha, the opening of Surah Al-Baqarah, uh, Ayat Al-Kursi, the last surahs or the last ayat of Surah Al-Baqarah, Aman Al-Rasul, uh, the last ayat of Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah Ikhlas, Surah Falaq, Surah Nas. These are the universal ayat. These are the universal ayat. And we know that Surah Falaq and Nas, they were revealed after the Prophet ﷺ was afflicted with magic. And this was something that he would seek refuge in Allah with. So these are the universal ayat. As for the ayat of Sihar, as for the ayat of Sihar, these ayat, you have uh, the 102nd ayah, uh, ayah of Surah Al-Baqarah. 
Then you have various other ayat, various other places in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Musa alayhi salam and the, and the magicians of Fir'aun. وَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَى مُوسَىٰ وَقَالَ فِرْعَوْنُ اُتْتُونِي بِكُلِّ سَاحِرٍ عَلِيمٍ uh, قَالُوا يَا مُوسَىٰ إِمَّا أَن تُلْقِعَ وَإِمَّا أَن نَكُونَ أَوَّلَ مَنْ أَلْقَىٰ These uh, surahs. If you give your email address to the brother, and maybe the brothers, if they want this, I have like a, just an email that I'll send you out. Most of the ayat are attached as in a PDF format, inshallah, you can print them out and they'll be uh, available for you to recite. There's other ayat where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions uh, the, the, the shifa, as I mentioned. There's other ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, you know, Ya ayyuhal, ya ayyuhal nas qad... Ya ayyuhal nasu qad ja'atkum maw'idatum min rabbikum wa shifa'un lima fi sudur wa hudan wa rahmatun lil mu'mineen Oh Allah, there has come, oh, oh mankind, there has come to you from Allah that which is a healing for what is in the breasts of mankind. <coughs> and a rahmah for the believers as well. So there's those ayat which are talking about the, the shifa within the Qur'an. Then there are those ayat talking about the weightiness of the Qur'an, the weightiness of the message of Tawheed. Inshallah, give your email address and I'll forward it on to you, inshallah. And, or I'll forward it to the brother and he can forward to as many of you brothers, inshallah. Okay, the, the sister asks a, a good question. How do you deal with evil eye if you don't know who has done the evil eye upon you? The first thing, like we mentioned, is the, the Ruqya. Do the, do the Adhkar for Ruqya. You have books like uh, Fortress of a Muslim. Fortress of a Muslim, just a small book. Inshallah, if you buy that book, there's a lot of Adhkar in there. There's another book from Dar as Salaam. Um, and in that book, again, it's called Ruqya or, or, or uh, Remembrances of Ruqya. It's like a burgundy color cover. And it's in Dar as Salaam. Inshallah, if you buy that, again, there's plenty, there's loads of, of, uh, of authentic azkar that the Prophet ﷺ, he would make. That's the first thing. The second thing is to put your trust in Allah. Know that nothing will harm you nor benefit you except with the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The third thing is to make ruqya upon yourself. So the first thing is azkar. Second thing is tawakkul. The third thing, make ruqya upon yourself. Now, what you can do, and some of the brothers have recommended this, um, is if you recite over water, recite over water, spittle into the water, drink the water and also take it in your hands and wash your face with that water as well. Wash your face with that water as well. And you, if you do this a couple of times in a day, insha'Allah bi'idhnillahi ta'ala, you will find that there will be an improvement. There will be an improvement. We have other things like Rukya bath, and things like this, but I tend to stay away from that because again, I try and stick within a, a fairly strict framework and Rukya bath, but some people have found that beneficial with the permission of Allah. They take the water that they have recited on and they fill up the bath with normal water and then they pour that Rukya water in, the water that they have recited on. And then they put in their lotus, uh, low tree leaves and they put in there uh, some, uh, some scents and they put in there some uh, spirit vinegar I think it's called and there's also some some uh, some powders that you can buy and they literally put that in there and they just lie in it you just lie in it so you're just lying in this cocktail of loads of different things I kind of tend to stay away from that because I can't see the the analogical deduction which hadith have you bought this from or which ayah from the Quran have you got this from I can't find that so I try and stay away from that but inshallah if you find that that may be beneficial then then you can also do that and obviously there is a lot of dua as well now the uh, the lajna in Mecca the, the standing committee of scholars they were asked sometimes uh, a raqi he asks the the person I'm going to recite and you're going to see the one who did evil eye, you're going to see that person in front of you. And they said this is not permissible. This is not permissible because the jinn or the shayateen, they may appear to that person and you may actually break up two families. So for example, it may be that the, the shayateen, they will appear in the form of that person's mother or that person's father. Now the person is not going to speak to his mom or dad. Now the person is going to be, become suspicious of his mom or dad. And what you've actually done is you've separated two families. So this is even worse than that one person suffering. You've actually split up two families. So, Ukhti, uh, stick with uh, Ruqya, stick with the Adhkar, stick with Tawakkul and stick with making a lot of Dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And inshallah you'll find that gradually, gradually you will improve. And also things like obviously we mentioned drinking Zamzam water and make Dua before you drink the Zamzam water. And Allah knows best. Any questions from the floor? Can the 
Um, the ruqya be recited in English? No, it should be recited. The question is, can the ruqya be recited in English? The answer is no. It should be recited in Arabic. It should be recited in Arabic and somebody who is doing the recitation, he should recite with clear tajweed. Um, linked with this, linked with this, let's say linked with this. Ruqya which is recorded. Ruqya which is recorded on a CD or a video or a link on YouTube. Is this as effective as uh, um, you know, live Ruqya? The answer is no. The answer is no. Because if somebody has just recorded, you know, you have Sheikh Sudais and he's recited these ayat and they've just picked out those ayat. Prophet Islam, he told us that every action is according to its intention. <coughs> Sheikh Sudais was leading, you know, Salat al-Taraweeh in Makkah. He had no intention of making ruqya upon you. He had no intention of sitting in front of you, Abdullah in Huddersfield or Halifax. He had no intention of doing this. So the ruqya is according to its intention. You should sit in front of that person. And the same thing uh, when reciting Surah Al-Baqarah. Prophet ﷺ, he mentioned that shaitan, he flees from the house and Surah Al-Baqarah is recited. They asked Shaykh Ibn Baz rahimahullah, and Shaykh Ibn Uthaymeen as well, is it permissible to just play Surah Al-Baqarah? Is it permissible to play Surah Al-Baqarah and does this fulfill the, the, you know, the requirement of Surah Al-Baqarah in the house? And they said no, because quite clearly it's mentioned the one who recites Surah Al-Baqarah in his house. So it's always better to recite. Sometimes if a person is unable to recite and they live like four hours away, I will send them a link of Ruqya. I will say, listen to this, let me know how you feel. So it's a way of just like a pre-diagnosis and just getting an idea. If the person listens to the Ruqya and he begins shaking and screaming and having a fit, you know this person is definitely afflicted. But some people, they listen to Ruqya, there's nothing wrong with them. But when you do the Ruqya on them live, they have a reaction. And this is all from the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the answer is definitely it should be in, uh, it should be recited in Arabic. And if possible, inshallah, with um, correct tajweed as well, if possible. Okay, the sister um, says, As-salam. Should be As-salamu alaykum. as I've been suffering from what I believe and I've been told is possession for the past eight years. The symptoms I have are vibrations in my body, weak mind, feel like I've, I have... Um, a heavy mind every morning and throughout the day along with many other symptoms such as anger and hearing th and, and hear sorry and feel like I'm being stabbed in the night and hearing things it prevents me from sleeping by pulling my hair and twisting my ankles when I perform when I perform Rukya and recite my voice stops coming out although I still am trying to recite please could you uh, perform any Rukya as I've tried all the things you have previously mentioned myself um, I'm not going to recite now over the mic um, because if like five people start having a reaction then <laughs> it's going to be mushkila. So inshallah I won't do anything now um, but maybe the brothers can give the sister my details inshallah um, or maybe inshallah if we organize this Rukya workshop then, then the Ikhwan from, from here can, can recite because I live like three hours away but inshallah um, Ukhti, what can, I, what can I recommend or what can I say to you? The first thing is sabr. And know that inna ma'al usri yusra, that after hardship comes ease. Know that la yukallifullahu nafsan illa wus'aha. Allah will never ever burden a person with more than they are able to bear. Know that inna Allah ma'al sabirin. That know that Allah is with those who are patient. Know that Allah says, Know that Allah says, for the ones who are patient, there is a reward without any hisab. There is no, there is no limit to the reward that they will receive. That's the first thing, uh, Ukhti. Have patience. The second thing is that you should rely upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Ibn Abbas, radiallahu anh, he was riding on a camel behind the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Ya Ghulam, O oh young boy, should I teach you something? And the Prophet ﷺ, he said, If you ask, ask only of Allah. And know that if all of the people and the jinn were to gather together and to try and benefit you, they wouldn't be able to benefit you except with what Allah has already decreed for you. 
and know that if all of the people, the jinn and the ins, they gathered together to try and harm you, they wouldn't be able to harm you except with what Allah has already written for you. So the fact is, Ukhti, this is a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And previously, if you weren't somebody who was practicing, or previously, if you weren't somebody who was making all of this dua and making all of this istighfar and making all of this ruqya and all of this recitation for each letter you're, you're reciting, you're getting 10 good deeds. Imagine Yawm Al Qiyamah, if this is your cause of entry into Jannah because you recited all of this ruqya, in the end, it was worth it. In the end, it was worth it. And it may be that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying you in this life to raise your rank on your Qiyamah. And it may be that Allah is trying you in this life to forgive you of your sins on your Qiyamah. That's the first or the second thing. The third thing, Ukhti, seek knowledge. Seek knowledge of your Aqeedah. Seek knowledge of Tawheed. Seek knowledge of Shirk. Seek knowledge of Sunnah. Because it may be that there is a weakness in your Aqeedah. As a result of that, you are not being cured by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The next thing I advise you to do is to continue with your ruqya. I don't know what you are reciting of ruqya. Make sure, inshallah, that you're reciting the ayat of sihr. From what you are uh, mentioning here, it seems like you are suffering with, with, with magic. And obviously there's clearly uh, external jinn at the very least. External jinn at the least and maybe even internal jinn present here. But Ukhti, another thing that you should do, make sure your home is a place of purity and a place of cleanliness. Burn Bukhur in your home so it smells nice. Make, seek ilm in your home, seek knowledge in your home so that the angels of, of Rahmah and mercy, they descend in your home. Make, uh, stay away from uh, you know, those things which are haram and make a lot of dua. And inshallah, if you contact me, then we can have a, a private conversation and I will ask you some other questions. But uh, increase and do not give up hope um, because only those who disbelieve they are the ones who give up hope. Never ever ever give hope in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inna Allah ala kulli shay'in qadir. Allah has power over all things and if he just gives the command be Ukhti you will be cured. So continue seeking that cure from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, with that comes an occupational hazard um, and you might feel the, the gins against that. So how would you obviously protect yourself and your family from that environment? Okay, question that uh, the brother is, ma mashallah, is asking is when you, um, you engage in ruqya, then you may be opening yourself up to the shayateen, there may be backlashes, etc. Firstly, by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I think that this is something which is a fear which is overplayed too much. People think about this too much. When you look at a businessman, what he does, it affects his life. When you look at a doctor, what it does, it affects his life. Anything that you do and you put your attention to, it will have a certain effect on your life. So for example, I might wake up some days and I've got like scratches on my face. But you think, you know what, carry on. Carry on, because the more you do, the more determined I'm going to become, the more adhkar I'm going to do, and the more I'm going to come closer to Allah, inshaAllah. That's the first thing. So you are going to get an element, you know, you, you occasionally hear banging or something might get misplaced here and there. It's like a child. If you give the child attention, it's going to carry on. Ignore it and continue. Ignore it and continue and they'll stop. Eventually they'll realize, you know what, we're wasting our time here. Move along. Move along. So that's the first thing. Don't pay too much attention to this because then you will begin to fear. It's natural to have a certain element of fear. You know, if a lion walked into the room, we're going to get scared. This is a natural element of fear. This is not shirk. But when you begin to fear something that is unseen and it begins to take over your mind, now you are leaving yourself open. Now your tawheed is beginning to get weak. So rely only on Allah. The second thing that you need to do you or your wife, once every three days, somebody needs to recite Surah Al-Baqarah in the house. Once every three days. Somebody needs to sit down, you can take it as a rota. And you know what, this evening, an hour and a half, two hours, I'm reciting Surah Al-Baqarah. But akhi, imagine the barakah in your house from the recitation of Surah Al-Baqarah. 
Prophet ﷺ told us, don't make your houses like the graves. Recite Surah Al-Baqarah in your house. I.e., in other words, the house where the Qur'an is not recited is like a graveyard, it's like a dead place. The difference between those who, who make dhikr of Allah and those who don't is like the difference between the living and the dead. So the point here is, it's going to be beneficial to you anyway. It's going to bring you closer to Allah anyway. Other occupational hazards that we might say. The fitna of women is one of the biggest fitna. The fitna of wealth is one of the biggest fitna. When I was, uh, there's a sheikh in, uh, in Pakistan who, who, who I took some knowledge from of this subject and his name is Iqbal Salafi. Uh, interesting name, but he said, he said, look, he said, my son, if Allah protects you from two things in this field, you've done well. If Allah protects you from the fitna of women and from the fitna of wealth, you've done well. In this field, if you want women, you will have plenty of women. If you want wealth, you will have plenty of wealth. So this is another one of those occupational hazards. Make sure that you're married and you, you know, you're okay and you're stable in your marriage, inshallah. Okay? Uh, another thing, it's not really too much, but you have to also think about the authorities as well. Like I had, uh, and I'm pretty like certain that she was a, a newspaper reporter. When, do you know when the, um, the girl was killed recently and, and they, it was all over the news. Just after that, I had a phone call. And she, she was like, I'm a non-Muslim, I want you to make ruqya on me. And she was asking me loads of questions. Do you charge? Do you beat? Do you do this? Do you do that? And there was nothing wrong with her. There was nothing wrong with her, but she was just there fishing, fishing. So you have to make sure that you, you are aware of this as well. Because we have to be aware of our external environment as well. Another thing, all those things which I mentioned about keeping the house a place of purity, a dhikr of Allah, etc. That's fine. If you have children, then just make, uh, uh, make protection, adhkar for your children. When they're able to, they make the, the uh, adhkar for themselves. Before that, like the Prophet ﷺ will do for Hassan and Hussein, then that's enough. After that, akhi, there's nothing else to fear. There's absolutely nothing else to fear. You pray five times a day, you make your morning and evening adhkar, you put your trust in Allah, you know your deen, there is nothing to fear with the permission of Allah. And anything that happens for you ultimately is good, is good. So just place your trust in Allah. When they see that, initially when you start, they'll try. When you start, they'll come into you in your dreams and they'll... But only for a few days, akhi. Only for a few days. When they realize that, you know what, he's not, he's not getting scared or it's not going to stop, they leave you alone. Alhamdulillah, by the grace of Allah, I haven't had any problems now for ages upon ages. And at the beginning it starts, but after that, and you always find that this is with the, with the, with the brothers who do ruqya, at the beginning, they'll start. The beginning, they'll try. But when they realize that there's no point, they leave you alone. They leave you alone. And then they try and focus on those around you. So make sure that your family is protected, your wife, etc. As for the sisters, a very important point leading on from this. When the sisters are not praying, i.e. they're on their... They're not praying, they're not able to pray. You are very, very open. You're very open to, to jinn possession or uh, to, to, to shayateen giving you trouble. So I advise the sisters, even though you're not praying, wake up at fajr time, make your adhkar. Maghrib time, even though you're not praying, make your adhkar. It's very, very important. It's just important to keep that protection up. And Allah knows best. Okay, the sister asks a question. Some people charge a lot of money for ruqya. Is this allowed in Islam? Is charging for ruqya allowed? First and foremost, the answer is yes. The answer is yes. What's the delil for this? What's the delil for this? There's a hadith in Sahih Bukhari and it's narrated by, uh, or it's on the authority of Ibn Masood radiallahu an. Prophet alayhi salam, he said, the thing which is most deserving for you to be paid or you to receive payment is for the book of Allah. The second thing, some companions, they were traveling. They were traveling and they came across a people and they asked the people uh, to, to give them some food and to be hospitable to them. The people refused. So they never looked after the companions. The, the chief of that tribe, the chief of that tribe, he was stung by a scorpion. He was stung by a scorpion. So they came to the companions and said, if you have any ruqya, recite it upon him. The companion he narrates, so simple, subhanAllah. He says, I went to this person. 
three times, morning, afternoon, and evening. I recited Surah Al-Fatiha three times. I gathered my spit and I spat into where the, where the uh, scorpion had bitten this person. And he was cured by the permission of Allah. Before they did the treatment though, they demanded payment. So the people they gave them, I think it was 30 sheep or 60 sheep, Allahu alam. 30 sheep or 60 sheep, they gave them some sheep as a payment. They said, we're not going to take anything until we go and we clear this with the Messenger of Allah They went to the Prophet and the Prophet he told them that you have recited or you have done something good, give me a portion of the sheep. So the Prophet he also took a portion of their payment. Now Ikhwani, somebody comes today and he charges you 80, 90, 100 pounds for one hour. This is not reasonable. This is not reasonable. And the scholars have mentioned, is it permissible to make ruqya a business? So somebody, nothing, he doesn't do anything except for ruqya. Doesn't have a day job. Doesn't have anything. He gets his income from ruqya. The scholars have mentioned this is not permissible. This is not permissible. Why? This is not from the way of the salaf. If somebody needs ruqya, then his brother helps him out. As for making ruqya a way of your, your income, nobody did this. It's not mentioned in the hadith. The companions, it was a one-off thing. They made the ruqya, they received their payment and they, they took it. But now do we have companions like, you know, what do you do? I'm a raqi and I do this for my living. No, we don't have this. We don't have this. So, ikhwani, and you hear, Allahum sta'an, you hear stories of brothers going and they recite for half an hour and they charge 60 pounds, 100 pounds. Subhanallah, subhanallah. It's and this puts people off. It puts people off because at the same time you can go to Peer Saab and give him 50 pounds. He'll give you a ta'weeth, he'll give you an amulet. You'll put it on, straight away you're better. Straight away you're better. So it's upon us brothers who are able to help our communities in the brothers and the sisters that we should help them. Now if somebody comes and they say, you know, I want to give you a gift, that's fine. I want to give you a gift, that's fine. You can accept the gift, there's no problem. As for establishing Rukia clinics, as for, you know, like a full-time Raqi traveling up and down the UK making hundreds of thousands of pounds, this is not from the way of the Salaf. This is not mentioned in the Quran and the Sunnah. And actually, unfortunately, Ikhwani, what the people are really doing, they are praying and they are taking advantage of people's weaknesses. They have spotted a gap in the market and now they are taking advantage of that gap in the market. And there's, uh, Ikhwani, there's people charging 250, 300 pounds for one hour. 250, 300 pounds for one hour. And you imagine if you need two or three or four or ten sessions, subhanAllah, it's big, big problems. So uh, I advise my brothers and sisters, stay away from the fitna of women in this field and also do not charge. Do it for the sake of Allah. Have your day job and then assign two or three hours in a week that you want to give for the sake of Allah, seeking His face, seeking His reward, and only from Allah that you do for the sake of Allah. And if somebody gives you a gift and they give you like 20, 30, 40, whatever they give, that's fine. But as long as you don't ask for it. And there's this new phenomenon now, somebody asks, do you charge? And you say, no, 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 I don't charge. But if you want to give me a gift, you know, yani, it's okay. Subhanallah, in a roundabout way, you've said, you know, that person is going to give you money now. In a roundabout way, it's like, you know, well, if you don't give me a gift, then you're cheap. You know, so in a roundabout way, you're asking for money. So we need to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and do it only for the sake of Allah. But at the same time, you know, if, if the brother is traveling and he wants his travel expenses, etc., that's fine. And if he does ruqya occasionally and he's had to take time off work or, or whatever and he asks for a payment, there's nothing wrong with this, inshallah. But if it becomes like a full time job and there's clinics, etc., then this, uh, I, I advise the people to stay away from this, and Allah knows best. Any questions from the floor? Guidelines for innovation in Rukia. Mm -hmm. Where do they advise from? For example, I mean, I've seen a couple of different people perform Rukia. And everyone has their different styles. And I've seen some where you might laugh, but like spices and stuff are being used in water and that sort of thing. Where does, is there a line between what's allowed and what's innovation? 
Shaykh al-Albani rahimahullah, he was of the opinion that if you take water and you recite on it and then you blow in it, you're an innovator or you've innovated. This is, this is a bid'ah because he said there's nothing in, in the texts to say that you can do this. But then other brothers and other, or other uh, muhaddithin, they have replied and said, no, look, we make qiyas from, from that hadith. And so as long as you can have a clear text or something to go by, but the general, the wider framework is the hadith. As long as the ruqya doesn't involve shirk, it's permissible. As long as it doesn't involve shirk, it's permissible. But look, if you're going to do jinn catching and now you're seeking the aid of the, of the shayateen and it may potentially lead to haram, that which leads to haram is haram in, in and of itself. So to close the door, we shouldn't go down that route. As for what you mentioned about spices and things like this, subhanAllah, uh, there, there are different types of jinn. And you learn this, there are different types of jinn. Some, you will, you will take some water and you'll spray it in their face and it'll be like acid. They will go crazy because they can't take the water. Some, you'll take the water and you'll recite in it and you'll, it might even be Zamzam water. You splash it in the face and they'll laugh at you in the face and say, what, should, what are you doing that for? You know, so there's different levels of jinn, different types of jinn. Some can take that type of thing. Others, they can't take that type of thing. So what the brothers do from experience, this is what they say now. You see, this is where the boundaries are beginning to, 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 to merge. I'm doing this from experience or I'm doing this based on a text. But the wider framework is whatever you do, as long as it doesn't potentially lead to shirk, as long as it doesn't contain shirk, this is okay inshallah. But Ikhwani, like you mentioned, different Raqis have their own different ways. And you know, some of them will take a towel and wrap a towel and beat you with it until you're black and blue. But subhanAllah, that's their way of doing it. But that's for the patient or the family of the patient to clear with the Raqi beforehand. Listen, what do you recite? Listen, how do you do your Ruqya? Are you going to touch my wife? Are you going to try and hit her? Are you... This is for the person to clear before the Ruqya even starts. Because sometimes in the heat of the moment, you may hit or something like this and all it happens in the heat of the moment. So it's better to get the, the, with the individual Raqi get it laid out before the Rukya session actually begins and say, listen, how do you do your Rukya? How do you do your Rukya? Because let's not forget, Rukya is from the deen at the end of the day. You have the every single right to say to me, listen, you blow on the water, why do you do it? Every single right you have. Because you don't want to do something, as the Prophet said, some said, treat your ill, but don't treat them with haram. <coughs> you don't want to fall into that which is haram. So you have every right to clarify with the Raqi before he begins. How do you do your Rukya? As for what I mentioned about innovations and things like this, there's generally it's quite a flexible thing, but subhanAllah, you know, some brothers they don't even recite. So they'll just put like earphones on and they'll put the, the Rukya in. Now I would say this is not this is not Rukya because subhanAllah, uh, you know, Rukya is to be recited by an individual, either upon themselves or upon another person. And if the, the, you're just sat there and the person's there, I could have given you that, I could have sent you that link. Why do I have to bring you to me, charge you 30, 40 pounds, sit you in the session and just to ask you a few questions? I could have done that over the phone. So it's, it's a very broad subject, but generally, and like I mentioned, so I try and keep it quite rigid. As long as I can trace it back to uh, something from, from a text, then I think I'm okay. But other brothers will say no, as long as it doesn't involve shirk, then that's fine. Ultimately, whatever you're comfortable with, but I would say stick with the Quran, the Quran is enough. And scholars mention about touching the head of the woman. I need to mention this. Um, they mention about touching the head of the woman. Is it permissible? Some would say if I, if I put my hand on the forehead and then I recite, it has more of an effect. Other scholars say, are you saying that your touch is more effective than the recitation of Quran? And of course, nobody will say yes. Nobody would ever say yes. Yes, my touch makes the Quran more effective. But then they will counter and say, no, it's a way of intimidating the jinn. So for example, if I ever do a session and there's four or five brothers around, I will introduce each brother by their name. I say, here's Abdullah and he hates you, he wants to kill you. Here's Abdullah, he hates you, he wants to kill you. Imagine you sit in a room and five men come and sit around you and they all want to kill you. You're going to feel intimidated. You know, you're going to feel intimidated. So this, sometimes it's about mind games and a bit of psychological games and things like this. And sometimes they do try and play with you as well and they try and lie to you and, and so you try and catch them out. Um, it's good fun, alhamdulillah. 
um, and you also get rewarded for it. So that's why I advise the brothers, inshallah, to you know to, to try and get involved in it because you know, inshallah, it's a good way to uh, you're aiding your Muslim brother. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ told us that whoever alleviates a difficulty from a Muslim in the dunya, Allah will alleviate for him a difficulty of his on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ told us that Allah continues to help a slave as long as he helps his brother. On top of that, you've got other things. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah mentions this is from the highest levels of jihad. Fi sabilillah. Because you're not fighting against a tyrant ruler, you're rather you're fighting against shaitan and his enemies directly. So subhanAllah, there's a, there's a lot of virtues of doing it. So I advise those brothers who are able to, inshaAllah, shaitan is going to come to you and say, but what about this, what about this, what about this? He doesn't want you to start. Put your trust in Allah and just get straight into it, inshaAllah. But keep, make sure you stick to what you are comfortable with. Don't do something which is beyond your ability because you may find you, you are in deep waters and you're not able to swim. Um, it's the same sister. Wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullah. My daughter has never suffered from seizures before. She went out one night and came back and was feeling scared and had a seizure. She has been given medication from the doctors. It does help stop the seizures, but because she feels scared, could it be something other than a medical condition? I'm guessing, sister, from the way you said as-salam and from your uh, handwriting, you're the same sister. So, like I mentioned, sometimes we have a, a, a situation where a sister or a brother is suffering and it goes and it actually begins to uh, start taking its effect on the children. So this may be what's happening here, that your, your daughter's illness as, is as a result of uh, the, the sihar which is done on you. In which case, you need to do the ruqya upon yourself and then we can do the ruqya on your uh, daughter as well. The second thing, as for her being scared, this is a, a very common thing. What you find is, it's easier for the shayateen to enter into a person's body when they are extreme of emotion. So they will, when a person is extremely stressed, it seems that, and Allah knows best, uh, Sheikh Abdullah Nasser, he's, in, uh, he's a muhaddith from Pakistan, he mentions this. He says that it seems that this is one of the cases. When the person is extremely stressed, that the shayateen, they will enter. Or when a person is extremely sad or depressed, then it seems, that, or scared, the shayateen, they seem to have like, uh, you know, it opens up a door or it just becomes a little bit easier for them. So you always find that when a person is walking past a graveyard and, they, and you say, okay, how did you feel? And they will literally say, I felt extremely scared. I began to shiver. I felt really, really worried. And then I just felt something enter into my body. So this fear, it may be linked with that, but we don't know where your daughter went, what she was doing, where, where you know, she may have been outside, etc uh, etc et we don't know any of the details but if the if the medication it does help to ease the seizures continue with the medication at the same time make ruqya it's okay to continue with conventional medicines and at the same time make the ruqya there's nothing wrong with that and i actually advise the brothers and sisters with that inshallah seek your normal means go to the doctor etc but at the same time, make ruqya upon yourself as well. And this will be beneficial for you, inshallah. Um, the sister asks a question. If a raqi gave you a taweez, an amulet for nazar, which is to be worn at all times, is this permissible? That person is not a raqi. If a person who gives a taweez, he's not a raqi. How would you know if the Arabic words and letters are true? Or if they say to place the paper in water and to drink it for two weeks, is this a correct way of protecting yourself? Uh, I mentioned in the, in the beginning the doctor who was spending a huge amount of time in the toilet and he was uh, unfortunately being raped by the shayateen. Somebody did the same thing to him. Drink this, put this, sorry, put this in water and drink this. So this is one of the ways that the shayateen can enter into your body when you drink that, uh, when you drink, that drink. As for wearing of uh, talismans and amulets, this is not permissible in this religion. Um, and we have to be very, very careful. Again, it's, it's maybe another subject in and of itself. But subhanAllah, Ukhti, uh, if the Prophet wasallam never did it, and we don't have any texts from the Quran or from the Sunnah, rather we have texts which prohibit it, and they prohibit it in a general sense and in a specific sense, then it's enough for us what was enough for the companions and the Prophet And it was enough for them to recite the Quran. It was enough for them to rely on Allah, make dua. They didn't need to write the Quran and then tie it around their neck or hang it up off their rear view mirror in their car, believing it was going to protect them. 
Allah says, Afala yatadabbarun al Quran. Will they not make tadabbur of the Quran? Will they not recite and reflect and ponder over the Quran? This is how the Quran is supposed to be used. It's not for decorating our walls, it's not for our background music while we drive, it's not for hanging around the necks of our children, etc. Even though, even though I think it was Abdullah ibn Masood, he allowed it, but this was his own ijtihad, he allowed it for children and he allowed it only when there were verses of the Quran. However, this was his own ijtihad and we have clear texts from the Prophet وسلم, prohibiting it. So we have to stay away from it. Recite the Quran, mention those things, do those things which I mentioned about combating evil eye and inshallah place your trust in Allah and that is enough for you as it has been enough for those people who have come before us and all those people who have come before us, certainly they are better than us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best.